Oh man, hello, sir. Hey. What you got going on there? Those are some nice nipples, huh? I have been working out. Yeah, I see that. You want to see something? I've been doing the same. Check out these bad boys. Oh my god. Check that one out. Wow. Man. Oh, I want to show you something. Check this out. I just got the Game Boy. What the fuck is that? It's a little portable Nintendo, man. Oh, God, get a load of this. What is, let me see. What is this? That thing, it's Turbo Express, Express. He has a big head. Oh. Oh, he has a big sword. Oh. oh. This is. This is a lot better than mine. Yeah, your Game Boy is fucking stupid. No fair! Oh, 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 oh. Turbo Express 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 It was the fall of 1989 and I remember just starting the third grade and I got home from school and we sat at the dinner table and this commercial played on TV. Bocharge games like China Warrior. Compare it to Nintendo's Kung Fu. Can you spot the difference? TurboGrafx-16 has 16-bit graphics that make characters up to 32 times bigger and almost 10 times as many colors. Turbo Action, Turbo Sound, TurboGrafx-16, the higher energy video game system. I remember thinking to myself, what the hell is the TurboGrafx-16? Why does it look so much better than the NES, which I was smitten with at the time? And who is this big dude? Why does he look like Bruce Lee? His name's actually Wang, and I wondered why were his nipples so much more detailed than Thomas's? Look at my nipples. Look at them! Kung Fu for the NES is a better game though. China Warrior on the TurboGrafx-16? Oh boy. We'll get back to that piece of shit later. Yeah. But anyway, back to the TurboGrafx-16 itself. This was the beginning of the Bit Wars. A couple weeks earlier in 1989, the Sega Genesis was released in the States as well. And look right at the console. It says 16-bit right on it. 16-bit arcade graphics. Everyone wanted you to know how many bits were in their consoles. And what the hell were bits anyway? What does bits have to do with anything? All we knew was that the Nintendo, the NES was 8-bit, and these consoles, supposedly, were 16-bit. What does it mean? Why the hell should anyone care? I mean, bits definitely didn't mean everything. The computer from Texas Instruments, the TI-99 4A, had a 16-bit processor. And look at its games. Did they even look better than the NES games you played? Nope. And guess what? The TurboGrafx-16 didn't have a 16-bit processor either. The TurboGrafx-16 and the portable version, the Turbo Express, which is the main focus of this video, actually contained a Hudson Soft HUC62080 processor. Now, even though this was an 8-bit chip, it actually operated at two different speeds, 7.16 megahertz and a slower 1.79 megahertz. So even though it was only an 8-bit CPU, it actually had a fairly high clock speed for the time. Now, you want to hear a fun little fact, the Hudson Hudson Soft HUC62080 processor was actually a better version of the 65CO2 processor, which was an improved version of the 6502 processor, which was inside the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, the 6502 in some way, shape, or form was used in a whole bunch of different computers and consoles, such as the Apple IIe, the Atari 2600, the Atari 5200, the Commodore 64, and the 6502 was even used in the Commodore VIC-20. So now you're probably wondering, Rich, why the hell did they call it the TurboGrafx-16 then if it has an 8-bit CPU? 
Well, it had a 16-bit picture processing unit, or a PPU, and its picture processing unit was way more capable than the one inside of the Nintendo Entertainment System. It had a palette of 512 colors, and it could display on screen at once 482 colors simultaneously. For comparison, the Nintendo Entertainment System's picture processing unit, which is known as the Rico RP2C02, had a measly color palette of 54 colors and could only display 25 colors simultaneously on the screen at once. Obviously, later on, developers found some trickery to get around that, but on paper, that's all the chip was designed to be able to output. Here's another fun fact for you. Even though the Sega Genesis had a much more beastly Motorola 68000 CPU, the TurboGrafx-16 actually bested it when it came to its picture processing unit. Even though the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16 had a color palette of 512 colors, the Sega Genesis could only display 64 colors on the screen at once. Whereas, again, the TurboGrafx-16 16 could display 482 colors simultaneously. So in the end, that's where NEC and Hudson Soft, because both companies collabed to make the TurboGrafx-16, were allowed to say it was a 16-bit system even though it kind of sort of wasn't. So how did the TurboGrafx-16 slash PC engine sell compared to its competitors? Absolutely terrible. It failed. By a long shot. In the end, the Super Nintendo slash Super Famicom sold approximately 49 million units worldwide. The Sega Genesis, or also known as the Sega Mega Drive, sold over 30 million units. And the TurboGrafx-16 slash PC Engine, depending on where you're from, sold only about 10 million units in its lifetime. Yeah. So yeah, the TurboGrafx-16 was a failure, especially compared to its competitors, the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, but it doesn't mean that the TurboGrafx-16 was a crappy system. As a matter of fact, I love the TurboGrafx-16, and even though I didn't own the home console, I owned this, the portableized version of the TurboGrafx-16, the Turbo Express, or it was also known as the Game Tank in other countries like Japan. Game Tank. Rolls right off the tongue. But this is still one of the coolest pieces of tech that I've ever owned. You heard me right. NEC and Hudson Soft released a almost no compromise portableized version of their current gen console, the TurboGrafx-16. Let's think about that for a second. That should blow your mind. Imagine Sony, after they released the PlayStation 5, about a year after they released it, they came out with a portable PlayStation 5, or Microsoft came out with a portable Xbox Series X. And I'm not talking cloud gaming or anything like that. It uses the same Blu-ray discs as the home consoles. Think about how mind-blowing that would be. That's what the Turbo Express was. You took the same games, the same Hue card games, out of your home console, your TurboGrafx-16, and you slid them in your Turbo Express, and you were playing Splatterhouse on the go. It was mind-blowing. And it is the only time in history that any company made a current gen console into a portableized version that played the same games. Not even Sega's portable Genesis known as the Nomad could claim that because the Nomad actually came out after the Sega Saturn was released in the States. So the Nomad was actually Sega making their previous generation console portableized. All right, so this is a portable at the time, current gen system, a portableized current gen system. There has to be some drawbacks to it, right? Yeah, of course, there's some big ones. We'll get into the negatives first. First off, it took six AA batteries, and if you were lucky, <laughs> if you were lucky, you got about three hours of playtime. Three. Three. Now compare that to the original Game Boy. Yes, it wasn't backlit. It had an ugly spinach green screen, but even the most conservative estimates say that the original Game Boy will get at least 10 hours of battery life. And on the more generous side, the estimates came from Nintendo, it could get up to 30 hours of battery life on four AA batteries. So less batteries, tons of more play time. So if you were going on a big car trip, which system would you want? The Game Boy? Or would you rather have the Turbo Express, which you would have to go through 18 AA batteries approximately and still not get the same amount of play time as four AA batteries? 
in the Game Boy. The second shortcoming of the Turbo Express was its screen. Now, for its time, it was absolutely amazing. It blew the Game Gear screen and the Atari Lynx screen out of the water. And if you own the Turbo Vision TV tuner peripheral, you could get, well, back in the day, analog signals, UHF and VHF, but you could also use it as a monitor for other game consoles like I did, or if you had one of those new fangled VCRs that also worked in the car back in the day, you could use the Turbo Express as a monitor so your kids could watch movies. Or one of your junior high classmates during your birthday party sleepover could bring over a VHS tape of porn and watch it on the Turbo Express. That literally happened. He was also a piece of crap and tried to steal something from my house too. And while he was waiting for his parents to pick him up, he was watching porn on my Turbo Express. Childhood memories. Well, anyway, even though the Turbo Express's LCD tech was amazing for its time, one of the big issues with the screen was a lot of times the Turbo Express came with dead pixels. My original Turbo Express from my childhood actually had a couple dead pixels on it. Luckily, this one I picked up from eBay has no dead pixels, but that was a big problem back in the day. A lot of people complain about their Turbo Express consoles having dead pixels on the screen. There was one other major problem with the LCD panel on this portable console. It had a resolution of 400 by 270 pixels. And again, the screen for its time was absolutely amazing. But here's the catch. The Turbo Express was designed to play the same games as the TurboGrafx-16. And the games for the TurboGrafx-16 were designed to be played on a television and work with TV resolutions. So when you played those same games on the Turbo Express, text was unreadable. Now, most games like Shooters and Bonk's Adventure, who cares? But if you were playing a text-heavy RPG, it would be unplayable on the Turbo Express's screen. Speaking of RPGs, you better hope the RPG that that you want to play on the Turbo Express had a password save feature because if it used the battery backup feature that the home console had, you weren't saving your games on the Turbo Express. So you couldn't play those RPGs or at least you couldn't save them. Another major problem that you're gonna have if you wanna pick up a Turbo Express now if you're a collector, which I kinda don't recommend because they're super expensive, is in a lot of cases, the capacitors went bad in these consoles, which in turn means that the sound won't work. So if you're picking one of these up off of eBay or whatever the case may be, make sure they were refurbished and new capacitors were put on, or make sure you have the technical ability to actually solder on fresh capacitors, because not Nine times out of 10, if not virtually every single time, the original capacitors in this console will be dead and you'll need to replace them. So FYI. And as far as playing two player on the Turbo Express, there were two games you could play using the Turbo Link cable. One game was Falcon, which was a flight simulator that had a head to head dogfight mode. And then there was Bomberman 93. And that's it, because keep in mind, the Turbo Express used the same games as the TurboGrafx-16, and most developers made their games with just the home console in mind. And last but not least, you wanna know what the biggest drawback of the Turbo Express was? It launched in December of 1990 for 250 US dollars, 250 bucks. Even just for inflation today, that's almost 500 US dollars. So let's think. 250 bucks for this? Or are you gonna get little Timmy the puke green screen Game Boy for 89.99 or 90 US dollars when it launched? Timmy's getting a Game Boy. But it's not all doom and gloom about the Turbo Express. This console, which was dubbed the Rolls Royce of gaming handhelds back when it was released, has a lot of amazing features and I still love it just as much today as I did when I was a kid. Now for one, the Turbo Express is really comfortable and really ergonomic. Now, I don't know if this was by design or it just happened to be really ergonomic because they had to make the console as big as it is because they were trying to cram a whole home console into something that's portable. Spoiler alert, you're not putting the Turbo Express in your pocket. But I think because the fact that it had to be so big, it makes it really comfortable to play on the Turbo Express for long periods of time. I have a slight case of carpal tunnel in my hand, so when I play the Nintendo Switch, I'll start to feel discomfort and tingling in my fingers. With the Turbo Express, I don't feel that. I think, again, because it is so large, my hands don't feel cramped on the console. 
Also on top of that too, the D-pad and the buttons on the Turbo Express are absolutely amazing. The D-pad is really responsive. It's just as good as the best D-pad you would use on a Nintendo console. And I also like that on Turbo Graphics 16 products, whether it be the Turbo Express or the home console, the gamepad has built-in turbo buttons. Especially when you play games like Bonk's Adventure, having those built-in turbo buttons are almost a necessity, and it's great that they're there. Now, I know earlier on in this video, I ragged on this console's LCD display, but for its time, it was absolutely amazing, and it still holds up to this day. It's a really nice looking screen, and back in 1990 and 1991, a screen this good on any portable device was mind blowing. When I purchased this Turbo Express from eBay, I actually could have had it modded from the eBay seller with a modern LCD screen, which would have been a lot nicer admittedly, but I wanted to see what the original screen back from 1990 looked like. And honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. Yes, all the shortcomings I mentioned before were there, sometimes text is hard to read, and it doesn't hold up compared to modern LCD displays, but playing platformers like Bonk's Adventure or games like Splatterhouse look great on this screen, and there's no ghosting. Compared to its competitors of the time, like the Atari Lynx and the Game Gear, which also had backlit LCD displays, the screen on here is head and shoulders above them. Fast action on the Turbo Express screen doesn't cause the image to blur like it did on the Game Gear and the Atari Lynx, and the colors on this old display are still bright and vibrant. Now, you see this giant tumor coming out of my Turbo Express. The console doesn't come with this. It's called the Turbo Vision, and it was a TV tuner for the console. The Game Gear did something similar, but the reason I bought this along with the console off of eBay is not because I wanted to get UHF and VHF signals. They no longer exist. I bought the Turbo Vision because it allows the Turbo Express to act as a monitor. It has an AV input on this accessory, and back in the day, what I used to do Check this out, my dad built me an adapter that would power both the Turbo Express and a console of my choosing, whether it be the Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis, and in the car, or on the go, I used to be able to use the Turbo Express as a monitor for my Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis. And it worked amazing, you could see it now, check it out. Now keep in mind as well, my top angle camera isn't that great, kind of sucks. So the screen actually looks better in real life than it does in that footage I showed you of the Sega Genesis games being played on the Turbo Express. But imagine it being a kid in the early 90s like I was and being able to play your Sega Genesis games on the go. Not practically, but when we went on long road trips, this is what I did. Yeah, I was a spoiled little shit. But man, was it awesome. Okay, so I almost went on for 20 minutes just talking about the TurboGrafx-16 and Turbo Express hardware, but what about games? If a console doesn't have good games, it doesn't matter how powerful it is, right? Well, guess what? The TurboGrafx-16 had awesome games, especially if you own the PC Engine in Japan. They got a whole bunch of good games over there we didn't get in the States, but I'm gonna talk about games that I have personally played and enjoy, and one that I really don't enjoy. And that one is China Warrior. This game is ass. First off, I got to give a huge shout out to YouTuber Lawn Boys Post 1975 Dave for sending Splatterhouse and China Warrior out to me. Yes, this game is a giant turd, but it's a nostalgic turd from my childhood. Again, thanks, Dave. I really appreciate it, man. So one phrase I could sum up China Warrior with is tech demo. This game has virtually no gameplay to it. I would compare it almost to an FMV game like Dragon's Lair. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it is graphically superior to Kung Fu for the Nintendo Entertainment System, but from a gameplay standpoint, I would play Kung Fu over China Warrior any day of the week. The controls in China Warrior are laggy, it's boring, it's repetitive, the same song plays throughout every single stage. and the boss fights are frustrating and have no rhyme or reason. Landing a hit in a boss fight is like winning the lottery ticket. You don't know how you did it and it's random. This game all around flat out sucks. Now let's get on to the good stuff. Bonk's Adventure. In the 80s and 90s, the unwritten rule for a console manufacturer was they had to have a mascot. Nintendo to this day has Mario, Sega had Sonic the Hedgehog, and NEC and Hudson Soft had Bonk. And they also had Johnny Turbo! Uh, really? He was never in a game, but he was in a couple magazines with TurboGrafx-16 comic book advertisements. Uh, it's so cringe. So cringe, the 90s were terrible sometimes. Kids, listen! Don't let them mislead you. The Turbo Duo is the first CD game system on the market, and they're giving you games that we already have! Why, we released Sherlock Holmes on CD almost two years ago! Hey, it's Johnny Turbo, and he's trying to ruin our master plan. He doesn't even look like a goddamn superhero. He looks like a fucking middle-aged dude. What was NEC and Hudson Soft thinking? That's like Microsoft hiring me to be their Xbox mascot and calling me Captain 4K. It would be laughably terrible. <sighs> Well, anyway, back to TG-16's real mascot, Bonk. He was a dude with a big head that he used to attack his enemies, and it made for a great platformer. Bonk's adventure was perfect. It had catchy music, great gameplay, great controls, bright, colorful graphics. If you have a TurboGrafx-16 or want to pick one up, I highly suggest getting Bonk's adventure and Bonk's revenge, too. Ah, Splatterhouse, I love this game. This was a port of Namco's Splatterhouse arcade cabinet, and it was a pretty solid conversion. Fun fact, on the TurboGrafx-16 version of Splatterhouse, Rick's mask is red. In the original arcade game, Rick's mask was white. Namco changed the color of the mask because they didn't want people to mistake Rick for Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th films. And also, hey, uh, Rich from the future here editing this video, just wanted to add that Rick's mask from Splatterhouse for the PC Engine, the Japanese TurboGrafx-16, was also white. Almost forgot to mention that. Well, anyway, back to the game. If you take away the horror aesthetic, this is a very simplistic beat-em-up, and I can understand why people say that the gameplay of the original Splatterhouse is very shallow, and I do agree, but there's something about Splatterhouse that just still pulls me in. Maybe it is that horror aesthetic, but I absolutely love this game. And yes, you could sit down and beat the original Splatterhouse probably in about 30 minutes at most, but I think it's a fun time and I could keep coming back to the original Splatterhouse over and over and over again. Street Fighter II Champion Edition for the PC Engine. Yes, I downloaded the ROM onto my Turbo EverDrive to play it on my Turbo Express. Sue me. But this game is a technical marvel for the system. First off, how they fit it onto a Hue card is incredible, because a Hue card is supposed to max out at 8 megabits. Street Fighter II Champion Edition for the PC Engine actually had a Hue card that was 20 megabits. And Capcom got around that limitation with something called bank switching, so they could fit more memory onto a Hue card than was technically supposed to be there. And that's how they got Street Fighter II Champion Edition to even work on the console. And man, not only is it amazing that it is on the PC Engine, it is a fantastic 
fantastic port. All the eight main characters are there, and you could also play as Barlog, Vega, Sagat, and M. Bison, and the only downgrade in visuals I see on the PC Engine version of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition is the lack of parallax scrolling compared to the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis versions. I would actually say that the PC Engine port of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition looks better than the Sega Genesis version. Now, there is one big catch to Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition on the PC Engine, and that's if you don't have a six-button gamepad, you gotta try to play a fighter with a two-button controller. And how did that work? Well, you would hit select to go back and forth between kicks and punches, and then you would have your light, medium, and heavy attacks. The light attacks would be the run button, so if you wanted to throw a light punch, you'd hit run. Or if you switched between kicks, you wanted to throw a light kick, you would have to hit run. Yeah, it's kind of awkward, but it's actually not as terrible as I first thought it would be, and I ended up playing a lot more of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition on my Turbo Express than I thought I would. This is a phenomenal port if you end up wanting to collect for this console. I highly suggest trying to get your hands on Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition for your PC Engine or your TurboGrafx-16 that's modded, because you'll have to mod your system to actually play the game on it. Okay, yeah, you can't play this on the Turbo Express, but I love this game too much to not talk about it. This is Castlevania Rondo of Blood, which was released for the PC Engine CD back in 1993, only in Japan. And holy crap, this is a hell of a Castlevania game. Now, Castlevania Rondo of Blood was ported to the Super Nintendo as Castlevania Dracula X, and it's a decent Castlevania game, but it doesn't hold a candle to the original. This is classic Castlevania at its finest. Perfect controls, amazing music, and if you want to play Castlevania Rondo of Blood now, just get a TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Because if you try to play this on the original hardware, boy oh boy it's gonna cost you. I don't recommend it, but this is a fantastic Castlevania installment, and I can't recommend playing it enough. Oh my god, Rich, you forgot to mention this game for the TurboGrafx-16, in this game, in this game, in this game, in this game! I know, I know, there's a whole slew of games, like Blazing Lasers, Newtopia 1 and 2, Air Zonk, Legendary Axe 1 and 2, New Adventure Island, Ninja Spirit, the pinball game Alien Crush, I used to love that, and countless other games, but don't worry! I just got it confirmed that Konami is sending me out a TurboGrafx-16 Mini to review, and I'll make a dedicated video on that. So if there's a game here I missed, it's probably included in that system. I can't wait to do a review video on that, so stay tuned for my TG-16 Mini review. So do I recommend getting a Turbo Express in 2020? Hell no. This thing goes for 400 bucks on eBay. You have to make sure the capacitors don't have issues because if they do, this thing will have no sound. And the screen, although it is impressive for how old it is, let's keep it real, it's a low res screen that's 2.6 inches and there's plenty of emulators and other ways out there, portable emulation consoles that can play games with a much cleaner, crisper picture for far less money. But the child in me who has had great memories with this absolutely loves this console. I'm glad that I have it and I got one that's in really good condition except for the fact that it has a 3D printed door in the back and this is something I'm going to keep. And it's actually really enjoyable to play. Like I said earlier in the video, it's super comfortable and I'm glad I have this in my collection even though I'm not a diehard retro collector. The best way to play TurboGrafx-16 games is by picking up a TurboGrafx-16 Mini. I think we'll find out in the full review video I'm going to do really soon. This is Rich of Review Tech USA signing out. Have a good one. Recording. <laughs> That'll go with the ending. That's perfect. Whoa, you're getting your balls on me.